so it's good to be back here in front. Um, so what I want to do today is I want to have three topics. So finish the thing that we started yesterday, which is talking about exaggerated probes of sub dark matter. Then I want to talk a little bit about direct detection of light dark matter, some of the new ideas that are out there. <coughs> and then finally, I want to put everything a little bit together, talk, go back to the model description that we had, the very simple model of a dark matter, of dark photon coupled to a dark matter particle. I want to tell you a little bit more about the constraints, how to get the right relic abundance, and then show um, how these future searches could potentially probe some interesting primary regions. Okay, so it's a bit to do in one lecture, so let's see how we do. So yesterday we ended up with um, this point here, right? So we first discussed dark photon searches, where the dark photon decays to standard model particles, so to E plus E minus, mu plus E minus, so directly to standard model. Then we said, let's bring down, let's imagine that there's a light dark matter particle, so then the dark photon can decay to dark matter. <coughs> and then we um, started talking about different searches, and you'll see that they're very similar to the searches that people have proposed for visible dark photon decays. So it's dark photon decaying directly to standard model particles. Uh, the techniques are, the, the, the colliders or the instruments that we use, beam dumps, etc. cetera, that, those are the same. How we look for them is a little bit different, as we'll talk about now. So yesterday we started with this missing mass. Uh, at an E plus E minus collider, for example, what you can do is you can collide those particles. You can produce a photon and a dark photon. And instead of having the dark photon decay to standard model particles directly, you can have it decay to dark matter. In that case, what you want to look for is gamma plus nothing. And what you can do is you can do a missing mass search with, by defining this quantity mx squared to be the center of mass energy minus 2 times the photon energy that you measure and times root of the center of mass energy. Sorry, s is the root of center of mass energy squared. So you can define this quantity, and you will get a bump at the mass of the dark photon. And of course, this is going to be above some background, but here I'm destroying signal events. There's potentially some finite width just coming from the finite energy resolution that you can measure. Um, I, drew, I wrote this before I realized this, this infrared cutoff should be there. So anyway, but this is in your notes from yesterday already. Okay. So let's continue today with, with, the, new, with the new stuff. <coughs> By the way, another way you can do this, you can also take a positron beam and shoot it onto a target. And then this way you can have a positron beam incident on, a, on the electrons in the target. So every target has some electrons uh, in the atoms. And you can take a positron beam, shoot onto electrons, and then produce the signal as well. So it doesn't just have to be an E plus E minus collider. It could also be a positron beam that you shoot onto a fixed target. Okay. Good. So then the next technique I want to mention. So this is A. That was number one for A. And number two is missing energy or momentum <coughs> and then some uh, references for this I'll just write them down if you're interested look at this further So here the idea is that we can take an electron beam coming in onto some target, T, and the electron will radiate the dark photon and get deflected. The dark photon is invisible, so I'm just going to draw these with dotted lines. Not that they're scalars, but I'm just drawing them as an invisible thing. Okay. Um, and then what you look for is, so there's this missing energy, or if you measure the momentum very carefully of the electron, there's missing momentum. Um, and remember that, so this is just a radiation that we usually have, so electrons coming in, interacting with the nucleus, radiating this dark photon, which then decays to dark matter particles. But now instead of radiating a dark photon that decays visibly, like what we saw yesterday, it can decay invisibly to standard model particles, uh, sorry, to dark matter particles which you don't see. Uh, and then what you have is if you're able to track the electron coming in, know its energy precisely, because you set up the experiments, you know what its, en what its incoming energy is, and you're able to track the electron very precisely, either me measure its energy or its momentum, 
you can measure if it's lost momentum or energy. So in order for this to work, you need to have a beam of electrons that's getting dribbled in. Okay, so you can't have a big dump of electrons. You need to basically tag each individual electron, measure its momentum very precisely. But if you can do that, then potentially you have a very powerful search uh, because you can look for anything that gets produced uh, invisibly. Okay. And the, the cross-section for this process is going to be proportional to z squared, which is just the, the number of atoms you have in here, number of protons you have in there. Again, there's an epsilon, and then there's some mass factor. Okay. <coughs> so, right, so then there's existing constraints actually ready from NA64. So there, was a, there are two papers, but the more recent one with more details is in 2017 at the end. Um, that 100 GeV electron beam at CERN, which they used as the incoming particles, and then they measured the energy. So what you can do is you can put a calorimeter here um, to measure the energy very precisely, or you can also put uh, your like tracking if you have if you instrument this region with your know, silicon trackers or something, you can measure the momentum very precisely and see how it gets changed uh, as the electron comes in and moves through. Um, so they have an additional, they already have a constraint that exists. There's additional data that's, as far as I know, that they're planning to take. And then there's also a missing momentum experiment being planned at Slack. called LDMX, Light Dark Matter Experiment, um, which uh, for a reference for the science case, the overview, we're just going to discuss a little bit what I did, but also it does other you know, more complicated dark sectors and different dark sectors as well. So you can look at this paper here, which is pretty recent. Okay. <coughs> so that lays out the science case. but. So the first data for this is not quite clear when it's going to happen, but maybe you know 2021 or 2022 or so. Yeah. And this will be result in some kind of dump in the missing energy because I expect there's a lot of background for this. So um, there's not actually that much background, right? So so usually if you radiate things, you uh, you'll you have to be sure that you don't miss anything, right? So you've got to instrument the whole region. You have to make sure there's nothing else being radiated and comes out no additional electron or so. So there's definitely background, and of course, you know, with any of these searches, that's going to be the big, big thing. But in principle, you can cut away a lot of the background. Uh, remember that the, most of the beam energy is radiated, is actually taken by the dark photon when it gets, when it radiates. So this is going to lose a lot of energy. So you would have some cut also on how much energy um, you would need. And most, or many electrons will just go, you know, straight through. So you need some, you, you have to have lots of cuts, of course, and make sure that you select signal events. Oh, sorry. Okay, Go first. So this is the prototypical example, but you can also look for other things, um, milli charged particles. You can look for inelastic dark matter type models. So what you can do is you can instead of having, um, maybe I'll, if there's time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about this more. But there's you can, instead of having two dark matter particles that are uh, have the same mass, you can imagine some two two dark matter mass states that have a small splitting in the mass. So they can look for, for those things as well. Um, yeah, so, so in this paper, there's a whole you know, various things laid out. But this is a prototypical model that, that is interesting to consider. As I'll mention at the end, like it gives a nice target in parameter space, which, I, which I'll explain still. I was uh, curious about the background from um, basically nuclear recoil. So how much energy is missing? I assume you're not measuring the, the, the energy of the recoiling nucleus. Uh, is that a problem? Ah, right, so this, this nucleus here, inside here, you would not, I mean, really, you would, you care more, you have to be able to track the electron very precisely and know that the one that you send in is the one that you see later on, right? So that's why you can't send in that many at one time. Um, but if the nucleus takes a lot of energy, you would see other events as well, often. Or it might be that the electron will lose a lot of energy. Yeah, so... So you have to worry about that, but uh, there's a lot of ways that you can try to... 
So what you can do, right, you can simulate these type of events, see how they look like in, uh, for the signal, and then you want to design some cuts to remove a lot of the background. But typically, you know, if you, so you worry about elastic nuclear recoils, for example. Yeah, I'm also, now that you're, you're, you're yeah. mentioning it, I'm wondering if it's elastic or inelastic. Yeah, but yeah, I'm thinking of elastic right now. Yeah, so. Mm. Well, I guess it couldn't be elastic. <laughs> if there's no. Well, what I imagine you're asking is the electron scattering of a nucleus just giving the nucleus a big kick. You have to make sure. I mean, the, you, then you have to ask the question, what, what does the nucleus do? So the nucleus is also going to leave some imprint, right? If you have a high energy beam, you know, 10, 20, 30 GB, or 100 GB as, as the NA64 has, uh, you're going to produce stuff. You're going to produce you know, pions and other things that, that you can then detect. Mm -hmm. And you want to not detect those. Yeah. So there's yeah, lots of ways to cut, cut that down. Okay. okay, so then closely related to this, but a little bit different. So here we're just looking for nothing, basically, right, being produced, and you're just tracking this, this thing here. But there's actually a way to get uh, another, more information from it, although the signal rates are a bit lower. So again, if we just take an electron beam dump, which is basically what this is as well, but what we want to do now is, so the setup is very similar. So here's my target. But now, let's produce the dark photon have a decay to dark matter. And basically what we have is a dark matter beam. Now, a relativistic dark matter beam. And what we can do is we can put a detector far, you know, uh, 10 meters back, 100 meters back, depending on how much energy you're putting in. You have to see what's, what's most convenient, but put a detector behind the thing. And the dark matter is gonna just go through this whole thing. You can put shielding here, of course, as well. The dark matter is gonna go through the whole thing and then Inside the detector, there's electrons and there's nuclei, there's some material. So what you can get is that the dark matter will come in and hit an electron, for example. And then you can look for a high energy recoiling electron. Okay, so this way, you're producing the dark matter, you're creating a relativistic dark matter beam, and then it's gonna hit an electron, for example, in your detector, and you can look for a recoiling electron. Okay, so that's a very, it's a pretty distinctive signal as well. And so here, what you're using, on the left side, you're using the same production, as I've shown here. But on the right side, what you're doing is you're using the scattering, the scattering diagram here. Okay. Where the dark photon mediates interactions with the electron and gives this electron high, a big kick. Yeah, that's right. So, so the, here the cross section, you're not paying anything. You're paying an epsilon squared. Here you've got to pay an epsilon squared as well. But there, you're right, you've got to pay another epsilon squared because uh, of the coupling. So in total, it's going to be epsilon to the fourth. Uh, but you have a bit more information here, right? Because you can sort of, there's fewer things that will be produced and then we'll have an interaction there. So both type of experiments are useful. Also here, you don't need to worry about measuring each individual electron. You can have a higher current. So there you have to worry about tagging each electron so you have a lower, you can put less electrons on target in a given time. You have to be a bit more careful. So at the end, the projections for what you could potentially do for this are better. But I think um, this is also very interesting and you can also potentially learn a bit more about the, the thing that you're producing. Like there's additional uh, handles you have. Okay. And there's experiments that are being proposed. So there's a constraint, an all constraint from a beam dump experiment that was done at Slack in the 1980s, so just reinterpreting this, which is E137, which we already heard about yesterday uh, in the dark photon decaying visibly to standard model particles. But there's also a projection from a proposed experiment called BDX. Beam dump experiment. And that's going to be at JLab. Maybe. <coughs> that's the proposal. Okay. Um, right, so let me, just, let me just write here. So the number of signal events here. So over there, it's epsilon squared. Over here, it's going to be 
alpha dark, epsilon squared, where alpha dark is this gauge coupling. So this is G dark, square root, you're going to get some alpha dark, okay? just like the fine structure constant, defined in a similar way. So this is just G dark squared over 4 pi, but that's the, oopsie, that's the proportionality, epsilon to the fourth, sorry. Okay. Uh, good. Questions on that? Okay. And then, <coughs> instead of using the electron beam dump, you can also use a proton beam dump. So again, you can use the neutrino facilities. And here the production, like we talked about yesterday, so you produce, in, if you have a proton beam dump on a target, you're going to produce lots of pions and mesons. So let's say you produce a pi zero. The pi zero will decay to a photon and a dark photon sometimes. So you've got some dark photon. The dark photon will decay to dark matter. So this is how you can get a dark matter beam. And then again, you've got some detector far downstream. And the dark matter will come in and hit an electron or a, or a nucleus. Okay. Um, and this type of search was done already. So this was proposed by uh, people. So here's a reference back in 2009. And then it was further developed in several papers, which I'm not going to give you the reference for. But this was the first one. And um, so Mini Boone did this. And the reference for this is 2017. So they did a run, I guess 2016 or so, and published something in 2017. Um, and there's proposals to do this at other neutrino facilities. Okay. Yeah. So, so let me just say there exists other proposals. So there's a whole bunch of searches, right? So just the simple model, uh, and one can make it more complicated, one can consider inelastic dark matter, one can consider other mediators, you know, uh, scalar mediators. Uh, as dark matter, you can consider vec scalars or fermions. Uh, there's various things you can play around with, um, but there's a whole bunch of searches you can do, and there's lots of proposals on the market right now. Question will be funding. Question will be funding if there's gonna be funding for many of these things, and I, I'm optimistic about that. Okay. Okay, any questions on this topic A? All right, so then let's go to B. So direct detection. Okay. <coughs> So we talked a little bit about direct detection for WIMPs, which has really been dominating the search over the last few decades. And the basic idea for WIMPs, the usual thing that people do, you look for nuclear recoils from dark matter nucleus scattering. And there's many experiments doing this. Have many experiments have done this in the past, and they've been scaled up. And the experiments that are leading the scaling up are now xenon one ton, which has recently released data for one year of running. So I think it's a one ton year of data. That's the exposure. So you measure the exposure in terms of mass times a time, how long you observe for. The more mass you have, the higher you have a chance of the dark matter in the halo interacting with the nucleus in your detector. And uh, of course, the longer you run, the, the larger time you have, the, the more chance you have as well. So exposure is usually given in, in terms of a mass times a time, and they have about one ton year of data. <coughs> so these are big, big experiments. There's an LZ coming up in the US as well, uh, which is going to be an experiment that's going to be put on the ground in the US. And this, these use xenon, okay? And there's big experiments also planned for using argon. So dark side uh, is going to use argon. 
Uh, there's experiments like Super CDMS, which is going to use germanium and silicon. Um, they're going to go for a little bit lower mass dark matter. But the constraints are you know, impressive. So let me, let me just put some blob here. The idea is the dark matter comes in, right, hits your nucleus, the nucleus recoils, and then you've got to look for a recoiling nucleus and someone measure, uh, measure something. And there's different things that a recoiling nucleus can do. It can usually produce, you can produce ionization, right? So you might ionize atoms, create some electrons, some charge, which you have to measure. You might produce some scintillation, some light. Um, <coughs> or you can produce some heat. Create some phonons if you have a germanium crystal, a silicon crystal. The dark matter comes in, hits a nucleus, it shakes the crystal, creates some phonons, creates some heat. You have super sensitive heat sensors, which I will mention in a, in, in a bit later, a bit more detail, how they work. Um, but you're going to create some kind of signal that you then have to look for. Okay. And different experiments use different things, um, different kinds of, of combinations of these, of these things. And then <laughs> what experiments do, so what you, what you want to do is you want to put this deep underground to shield it from cosmic rays. It's a ray event search, right? So basically, in a ton year of data, xenon did not see any, essentially did not see any signal events. Okay. So that's an amazing sensitivity that you see nothing, basically. Uh, now, there's, of course, a lot of things they see, but a lot of it is background. And there's a lot of radioactivity around you. There's cosmic rays you have to worry about. So you go deep underground to avoid cosmic rays. But as you go underground, there's also radioactivity. Um, you've got to control that. You have to deal with that. So these experimentalists are doing an amazing job doing all that. And uh, they basically are able to do a background-free search with a massive exposure. And people have been learning about this for the last few... I mean, this, this program has been going on for the last... Um, two, three decades. Um, and usually what, at the end of the day, right, you hope, to, of course, to see some signal, but if you don't, you draw a exclusion look curve. The exclusion curves look as follows. So usually you've got a plot of dark matter scattering of nucleus on the y-axis as a function of the dark matter mass. And then, here, let's put this in GeV. 1 GeV, let's say 10, 100, so some log scale, and then 1,000. And what you see is a curve that looks something like this. And then everything above this curve is excluded. So the point is that for large interaction strengths, large cross-section, then you would have seen dark matter scattering of nuclei events in your detector. And if you don't see them, you rule out large cross-sections, and at some point you get to small enough interactions that you don't have any constraint. So what's the shape of this curve? Why does it look like this? So basically, at low mass, the problem is that if the dark matter mass is very small, you don't have enough energy in the dark matter particle to give the nucleus enough of a kick to see it above threshold. So it just doesn't give you much ionization, scintillation, or heat. You can't see it. So below some mass, you just are, you detect is blind, and there's no exclusion. Okay. So this is an effect from the threshold of your experiment, the energy threshold, the mass threshold. Once the dark matter mass gets large enough, you basically have no problem seeing a signal. Um, but why does this curve rise? Why does the limit get weaker and weaker for larger masses? The rate's too low, so the rate decreases. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And why does it decrease? Because the, the dark matter abundance is fixed. So if the dark matter particles are heavier, then you have this uh, much mm -hmm. uh, more number. Good. OK. So basically, the, the number of dark matter particles you're sensitive to is, is just the, the rate. And that's going to be proportional to the number of dark matter particles in the halo right, times the cross-section. But the number of dark matter particles in the halo is um, not what we know. What we know is actually that the number density, the energy density, uh, the, the mass density, that's what we actually know, have measured. So the energy density locally in our halo is about 0.4 GeV per <laughs> cubic centimeter. OK, 
Okay, so very roughly, if you've got a 100 GV dark matter particle, a WIMP, then in each liter of space, you have an order one dark matter particle. So on any given instant in time, there's about one dark matter particle in this bottle, okay, for a WIMP. Okay, as you increase the mass, you have less of them. Okay, so because the, <coughs> right, so the, the number abundance, let me put this chi, the number abundance is given by the energy over the mass. Um, so as you increase, so this is fixed, so as you increase the mass, you've got less of them in the halo that you can actually scatter with, right? You need, you need less dark matter particles if the mass is heavier to make up a certain mass density or energy density. So this is why this thing will just decrease as the mass increases. So the rate will just decrease, okay? So that's how the curve looks like. That's why the curve looks like that. So the best limit right now comes from xenon one ton, and it's at four times minus 11 picobarn, assuming I read the numbers correctly from the plot yesterday. Uh, and this is about at, at the, the minimum for them is about at 30 GV. Okay. And then they have no sensitivity below a few GV. Um, <coughs> Now we're interested in low mass dark matter. So what happens? So let's actually look at the energy, rec the recoil energy in a bit more detail. So for low mass dark matter, what happens is that the dark matter first of all has less energy, less kinetic energy. Remember the dark matter particles is non-relativistic. So it's moving at a speed of a few hundred kilometers per second. So in terms of C, it's 10 to minus three C, okay, in terms of the speed of light. And so, uh, so basically the energy is just given by the kinetic energy. The, the, the interesting thing is just the kinetic energy, which is a half mv squared. Um, and as the mass decreases also, another problem is that it turns out that you know, once the mass gets much less than the nucleus that you're trying to scatter off, the amount of momentum you can actually transfer to the nucleus also decreases. So at the end of the day, you get hit by a big suppression in the nuclear recoil energy that you have access to for low mass dark matter. So for low mass dark matter, the nuclear recoil energy is Q squared over 2mn. <coughs> so that's just momentum transfer from the dark matter to the nucleus over twice the nuclear mass, mass of the nucleus, which is the maximum momentum transfer is given by Two mu chi n, that's reduced mass, times v chi squared over. So the maximum momentum transfer is just two mu chi n v chi. Square that, and get a factor of two. I get a factor of four, to just divide by two is the two fac factor of two there. And then we can just put in some typical nucleus. Okay, so let's put in, let's put in the light nucleus, so like silicon. So the maximum energy. It's about 100 EV for a dark matter mass of 500 MeV and a nuclear mass of 28 GeV, which is for a silicon nucleus. Okay. And what you see is that there's a suppression of m chi squared. So as you lower the dark matter mass, very quickly you get no energy. Okay. So if you lower this by another factor of uh, five, then you got you know, five squared, 25, so then suddenly four EV. So for 100 MeV, it'll be you know, four EV. So there's very little energy that you can do anything with for a recording nucleus. And in order to see ionization or scintillation of heat from a recording nucleus, you really want some larger recoil energy. And that's why all these experiments then are blind at the moment to this. And if you make the he nucleus heavier, like xenon, then um, it's even a bigger problem. Right, cause, so, the, so lighter nuclei help you. So if you want to access the low mass dark matter, there's several things you can do. And there's been a ton of ideas out there over the last you know, several years. Uh, I'm not going to review them all, just because I don't have the time. In this Cosmic Visions paper, review paper, there's a lot of them laid out, although that's already even out of date. But there's several things you can do. I mean, one thing you could do is just take a very light nucleus that's going to help you a little bit. 
So instead of taking silicon, you can take something very light like helium. That's going to help you. And there's some very nice ideas of using liquid helium, um, superfluid helium, to try and actually um, do a dark matter search. Um, there's some very nice, there's very nice work going on in that direction. Um, the lowest current thresholds that exist is a very impressive work by Crest in which they used about one gram of sapphire, <coughs> which is aluminum Al2O3. But that's a tiny detector compared to the ton scale xenon detectors. But nevertheless, they got actually down to 20 V threshold, which translates into, turns out, a mass threshold of about 130 MeV. Um, so they get down to 130 MeV. But the cross section that they exclude at that level is. is a cross-section limit of 3 times 10 to the 5 picobon. Okay, So you've got this very deep thing here, 4 times 10 minus 11, and then the th limits rapidly rise. And yes, there's a limit 130 MeV, but it's setting up you know, many, many orders of magnitude up here on this plot. Okay. <laughs> but this is great, and of course, you know, people are working hard to, to do this. So what I want to do now is I want to tell you briefly about some other ideas to try and <coughs> uh, go to low mass dark matter. So one uh, very promising direction to probe low mass dark matter is to search for electron recoils. from dark matter electron scattering. So a very simple idea. So instead of scattering of nuclei, you just want to scatter the electron and get some kind of signal out from there. And scattering of the electron actually is, is so the reason to scatter of the electron rather than the nucleus is that the electron is very light. So by scattering of the electron, you can actually potentially transfer much more energy. You don't have to scatter off this big you know, fat nucleus, which as a light dark matter particle, you don't, you don't really want to. Um, so rather, you can just do the electron scattering. Okay. So this idea was first proposed in 2011, and um, over the last few years, there's been a lot of work to try and actually realize it. And recently, there's been some breakthroughs in terms of the technological ability to try and detect electron recoils. And I want to just very briefly, you know mention two of these efforts. <coughs> so the idea, right, is that you have the dark matter particle coming in, so you've got your atom, uh, there's a little electron going around your nucleus, sorry, that was supposed to be a nucleus, not an atom. The dark matter particle comes in, and then we'll scatter off the electron, and the electron will uh, get, get a recoil. And depending on what the material is, so if you have an atom, then you would ionize the atom, so you would look for some electrons. Um, if it's a semiconductor, like silicon or germanium, then you would take an electron from the valence band and push it into the conduction band. Okay. So before, we, before I talk more about that, let me just say some things about what you could potentially do with this. So the Okay, so let me just write this. So signal that you're looking for is one or more electrons. <coughs> so initially you've got one electron that comes out, but what might happen is that this electron has a bit of kinetic energy and could ionize other atoms. So you might actually get two electrons out, or three or four. And you can calculate the spectrum in principle how much you get. But you get one or more electrons out. Uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to get 10 out, or 20 or so. You want to get a few at best, Okay, more likely. 
Now, one interesting thing is that, let's talk a bit about the kinematics. So the electron is bound, so it doesn't actually have, so it has a well-defined energy, but it doesn't have a well-defined momentum. In fact, it can have an arbitrary large momentum. It doesn't really matter. So it has well-defined energy. The momentum it has is described by some wave function. Okay, there's a wave function that will describe the electron's momentum, what it has. <coughs> and it, for an atom, like for the hydrogen atom, the momentum of the electron is what? what? What's the typical momentum of the electron? So I said it can be arbitrary, but there's a typical momentum, a most likely momentum. What is that for a hydrogen atom? Just the Bohr, moment, Bohr model. What's the velocity of the electron in the hydrogen atom? C over alpha. C, C over alpha. Or C alpha. C alpha, yeah. Okay, so C alpha, and we, can, we, don't, we work in natural units, so there's alpha. Okay, so, so the typical momentum is, uh, so that's the velocity, and the momentum is just alpha times the mass, so alpha times me in you know um, in the hydrogen atom and this is a few kV <coughs> so um, that's the typical momentum but it can have arbitrary high momentum or even low momentum but it's going to be suppressed by some wave function okay so before I continue, so, so this is an important point, which I'll get back to you in a second. But let's first uh, ask the following question. So let's imagine that I've got this dark matter particle with a low mass. It has a kinetic energy of a half mv squared. And let's imagine that I can take this whole energy and give it to the electron. What's the lowest mass I could hope to probe using this? So what we can do is the following. So there's some binding energy, right, that you have to overcome. So without overcoming the binding energy, you can't see anything. So that's some delta E. And what we want is that this binding energy is below what the energy is, kinetic energy is of the dark matter. So at the very least, what you want is that the dark matter, the dark matter kinetic energy, which is a half m chi b chi squared, should be bigger than this delta E. And we can put in some numbers. So we know what v chi is. Right, what do we say? It's 10 to minus 3 C. Okay. So a few hundred kilometers per second. So if we put in some numbers, <coughs> um, in fact, we make it a little bit more optimistic. Really, what you have is you've got the dark matter moving, and also the electron is moving in the, you know, the, the, the Earth is moving, and the largest, you, you've got the dark matter moving at some, some velocity. The largest, velocity that the dark matter can have is the escape velocity but let's be a bit more optimistic actually what you can get the largest energy that you can get is not just the escape velocity in here but the um, the earth is also moving the sun is also moving so you could potentially imagine sort of a head-on collision with one dark matter particle coming in one, in one way, which is uh, one side, which is of esca escape velocity, and um, the Earth moving in the opposite direction, which is also of order 220 kilometers per second. So the maximum possible velocity is right this here. So let me not call this V chi, but let me just say that the energy that you need is V, where V is less than the escape plus the Earth velocity. So this is going to be 544 plus 220 kilometers per second. And then we can put those numbers in, and what we get is the following, that we need the mass of the dark matter to be bigger than 
300 keV in order to overcome a binding energy of one electron volt. Okay, and this is imagining sort of a head-on collision, Earth going one way with a detector on it, dark matter going the other way at the maximum possible speed. So then if you've got a system where you've got one electron volt overcome, you can hope to get 300 keV of, uh, you can hope to probe down to 300 keV. Okay, that of course assumes that you can detect an electron that's at very low energies. But in principle, um, you can go, you know, three, four orders of magnitude lower than what the typical WIMP searches do um, here. So now let me, uh, so some principle, right, so this, this should work. We can get to very low mass dark matter if we can see the signal. So now let's get back to this point here, that the typical momentum transfer is alpha me. So if you think about the dark matter scattering of the electron, the dark matter, in my example, what I'm going to take it to be, let's imagine, so it gets, it gets more complicated if the dark matter mass is low, but let's imagine it's like 10 MeV or 100 MeV. So it's, it's above the electron, okay, Ma above the electron mass. The dark matter is moving at a speed that's about 10 to minus 3, okay, in units of C. The electron is moving much faster. It's moving at alpha, which is 1 over 137. It's about 10 to minus 2. So the electron is actually moving really fast compared to the dark matter. And the electron is also very light. So what you basically have is a big object, the dark matter, scattering of a small, very fast moving object, the electron. And you can ask, what's the typical momentum transfer in that system? And it's basically going to be set by the electron. So you can imagine the dark matter sits there, the electron comes by with some momentum, which is alpha me, typically. Hits the dark matter and then recoils. And the maximum momentum transfer is going to be set by alpha me, by order 2 alpha me. So let me write that and see if it's clear. So typical momentum transfer So it's set by electron, not dark matter, since electron is moving fast. And has a small mass. Yeah, I, but just for this simple estimate, I want to make it simple to, so I can just use this, uh, use some hand wavy argument now. But in principle, of course, you can do it, the full calculation of what you're able to do. Okay. <coughs> this is the ma maximum possible energy you can transfer. The question is, will you transfer this amount of energy? And that depends on, on the system. Okay. So if that's just saying that it's in principle doable, and what I want to quickly work out now is what the typical momentum transfer is and the typical energy transfer. Okay. So these experiments are all interacting with the dark matter halo, right? Mm -hmm. Why not shoot the dark matter beam towards these experiments? Uh, then you, I mean, that's sort of what the beam dump experiments do, right? And, uh, but then you don't need super sensitive detectors. Uh, you don't need very low, sorry, let me say this again. You don't need very low threshold detectors because then you've got a relativistic dark matter beam, you can deposit a lot of energy. But that's really asking a different question, right? Because then you've got to produce it in the lab, and then you've got to detect it. Whether that particle that you're producing is actually the dark matter or not, and a halo, who knows? So we just want sort of a multitude of ways to look for the dark matter. And one of them is to assume it's there, and let's see it scatter off of our particle. Okay. If we find something in a beam dump, that'll be fantastic, but we still then have to figure out, is it really you know, stable on cosmological time scales? Is it maybe a particle that decays you know, after one second? It'll still look like dark matter to your experiment because everything's relativistic, everything's moving very fast. But you don't know if it might decay like a second later or so. So there's lots of, you want different handles if you can. Yeah. Okay, so the typical momentum transfer is um, set, is basically given by, so let me write this. So mu chi e times the relative velocity which the 
because the electron is moving so fast, it's just given by the electron velocity. So let me just write this. Okay. So that's just the momentum of the ball uh, of the atom. And that's a few kV. <coughs> so 511 kV times 1 over 37. Um, and then you can calculate that the typical momentum transfer, sorry, the typical energy transfer is going to be given by the typical momentum transfer times the dark matter velocity. So there's some kinematics to show this. Okay, so I'm not going to derive it here. But basically that's the typical energy transfer. And what you then have is 4 kV times 10 to the minus 3 for the speed of light. So that's about 4 eV. So what you see is that in this simple atomic system, the typical energy transfer from the dark matter to the electron is a few eV. That's just the typical value based on what the typical momentum is of the electron. But again, the momentum is arbitrary. So in principle, you can go to much higher momenta and get much larger energy transfer up to a maximum of this, half mv squared. Okay. Okay, but that's sort of a useful number because that then can inform what kind of things you want to look for, what kind of systems you want to use. And in particular, we have, you know, we've got some sort of uh, known choices. Well, we, we've got a few obvious candidates for kind of what kind of targets we want to consider, um, which I'll discuss now. Let me just write here, more energy is possible, but the rate is suppressed because you need to sit on the momentum wave function. You need to sit on the tail of the uh, wave function of, for the momentum distribution of the electron. So it's unlikely, but it's possible. And of course, you can calculate what the rate is. You can do the full calculation for what the electron's momentum wave function is in various atoms or in, in semiconductors. And then you can get the spectrum um, like that. So let's talk about target materials very briefly. So xenon is uh, a typical target material, um, or argon. So let me make a little table. You can consider noble liquids. Let me give an example. And say what the binding energy is of that system, what the lowest mass threshold is that you can probe and sort of what the status is right now of what experimenters have achieved. So noble liquids, very commonly used, like xenon, right? Those are the ton scale detectors. There's also argon. Uh, the typical binding energy for an atom is order your know, 10-ish EV for the electron in the outermost shell. If you go to deeper shells, of course, the binding energy is larger. But if you're just asking what the easiest electron is to ionize, to, to, you know, the, the outermost shell electron, what the energy is to ionize that, it's about um, order 10 eV. And that you just know from the hydrogen atom, right, 13.6 eV. So on that scale, that's what the binding energy is. <coughs> so the mass threshold that you get, right, based on the simple estimate over there, is about 3 MeV. Uh, I'll talk about the stages in a second. So then you can have semiconductors. like silicon or germanium. So silicon and germanium are interesting because they are a, uh, they're a semiconductor. So what they have is a, who remembers some basic solid state physics? So there's some valence band. There's a conduction band. Um, and the valence band is filled, then there's a little gap. It's called a band gap. That band gap is basically what delta E is. 
and that's typically about one electron volt. So germanium is 0.67, for silicon it's 1.1, so it's about one electron volt. And if you can get an electron from the filled valence band to the conduction band, you can conduct charge. Okay, that's how your computers, etc., work by doping silicon appropriately, etc., making transistors, etc. Okay, so the idea is that here you would just hit an electron, promote it to the conduction band. <coughs> and the mass threshold there would be about 300 keV. Um, <coughs> there's other materials that you can consider, like scintillators. Scintillators you can think of as very similar as semiconductors, um, but instead of once you ionize the electron and sits in conduction band, you're not going to measure the charge. Instead, the electron is going to recombine with, with the hole that you had left behind, or there's going to be some impurity or something which is going to trap the electron, and you're going to get light out. So in that case, you're going to get to see some photons, one or, or one or more photons. And there's various examples like gallium arsenide and others. And the band gap is of that same order. Okay, so the mass threshold is of the same order. Uh, then people have talked about superconductors. And examples um, <coughs> are aluminum, aluminum, or other things like that. Um, superconductors are interesting, so there you have uh, Cooper pairs, for example, so little bound pairs uh, of electrons, which the binding energy is about a milli EV. And in principle, if you're able to, you, have, you can probe very low mass dark matter with this, where you have a dark matter particle just you know, create some quasi-particles, a little bit of heat in the system, and in principle you can get down to you know, order KV, few KV in mass, okay, which would be nice because that's the warm dark matter limit. But you have to be able to measure very, very small signals in that. Okay. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other things which, which we can list, uh, which is given in this review paper. So people talked about graphene, uh, there's polar crystals, people are using Dirac materials and all kinds of interesting condensed matter systems. Um, now, the status of these is that for noble liquids, there's been, there's a limit on low mass dark matter going down to about this mass, a few MeV, from an old experiment called Xenon 10, which is the precursor to the Xenon 1 tons, and the Luxes and LZs of today. That's an old experiment. They were actually sensitive to single electrons. Okay, and they have a low, they were, they were sensitive to single electrons, but they saw a lot of single electron events from some kind of background which, where people are still trying to understand exactly what it is. Um, but there is a limit uh, that you can get, uh, but it can be improved. So there exists constraints, and I'll just say improvements are possible. Scintillators, you need to see photons. R&D is needed. Superconductors, you need to see very low energy things, so R&D needed. And there's lots of other things where R&D is needed. The thing that's probably made the most progress over the last two years or so is to use silicon um, and here experiments exist that, that could do that and in sort of a few minutes I want to tell you very briefly about, about two of these efforts. So, using silicon, uh, two efforts have successfully demonstrated sensitivity to uh, single electrons. <coughs> so one of them is a collaboration called Sensei. 
So Sensei uses CCDs. So those are the things that you, know, you have um, <coughs> in many different places, but these are fancy CCDs, which uh, which consists of you know maybe a million pixels or so. So let me just draw a little. I'm very good at drawing. Let me try this. So there's some CCD, and CCDs consist of you know lots of pixels, maybe a million pixels or so. <coughs> yeah. Okay, not great, but okay, you get the point. So there's a CCD, which consists of order a million pixels or so, um, consists of silicon. The idea is that dark matter comes in somewhere in the silicon, hits an electron in the silicon, excites the electron from the valence band to the conduction band. Depending on how high it excites it, you can create one or two or three or four electrons. Okay? Really what you do is you create electron all pairs, because if you take an electron out from the valence band, there's a hole left behind which is positively charged, acts like a positive charge carrier. So you create electron hole pairs, and you can create one, two, three, four, or so you, you create a few. And there's a, there's a sharp drop off in terms of how many electron hole pairs you create. So the typical energy transfer is a 4 EV, that's well above the band gap of 1 EV. And it turns out that you actually get like more like two electrons, typically. Okay. And you can get more, but there's going to be suppression. So at the rate of your signal, in terms of number of electron hole pairs that you create, will peak at two and then sharply drop. So one, two, you know, three, four, five, etc. And that's a log scale. So this one, by the time you get to sort of 10 electrons, you're many, many orders of magnitude below the peak here. So if you're sensitive to just a few electrons, you can create, you can probe orders of magnitude more parameter space. You know, you have access to orders of magnitude more dark matter signal compared to being sensitive just to 10 electrons or, or more, for example. Okay. So lowering the threshold of these experiments is there's a huge payoff. So what uh, Sensei is able to do is they so they use CCDs. So the way CCDs work is that you expose the image, if you like. Uh, you hope the dark matter comes in, hits a few of your pixels. So you then what you do is you create, so let me look at it from top down now. So you have a bunch of CCD uh, pixels. Um, <coughs> and then what you, what you do is you move the charge. Uh, so let's say you create some electrons of color. Okay. Uh, you expose the CCD and then you have to read out the CCD. The readout happens at a, one of the corners in the CCD. Um, what you do to get the charge to the corners, you have to move it. So what you do is you move all the charge in each of the pixels down, even the empty pixels. You move down to the bottom and then you move it from left to right. So you shift it down once and then read every single pixel in this row. Then you shift the next charge down, read everything. Shift, read, shift, read. Um, and what's been demonstrated is that by reading, what, what you're able to do now is you can read the same pixel, the charge in the pixel, multiple times without destroying the charge in the pixel. So you can make a measurement of the charge in the pixel a thousand times or so. The way that is done is that the electron goes to the corner, and then you can imagine there's some like capacitor attached to some voltmeter. The charge comes, it changes the voltage, you measure the voltage. And then what you do is you move the charge back, the voltage resets itself, you move the charge forward, you measure the voltage again. And you do that like a thousand times or so. Take the average, you've got an amazingly accurate number, measurement of the, what the charge is in that pixel. Well, you want to... Uh, the, the spatial information is useful because sometimes there's a cosmic ray event that's going to create tons of electrons. And you don't want to mix that in with potential dark matter events. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, so what's been achieved now is that the noise of measuring the pixels is about 0 0.05 electrons per pixel. Okay, so you can measure very accurately how many electrons are in a pixel. You can measure there's one, two, three, there's no confusion anymore. Before that, a few years ago, the noise was about two electrons. So then, if the noise is that high and you have a million pixels,
the chance that your measurement gives you 10 electrons sometimes is very high and your noise dominated and the threshold that you can set sits at 10 electrons which is losing a lot of dark matter signal but now you can set the threshold much much lower gain a lot of dark matter events so now you can do a really sensitive dark matter search and then um, the plan is to use to build an experiment basically to build a hundred grams uh, use 100 grams of the CCDs they have a special name, they're called skipper CCDs but whatever, so the plan is to use 100 grams of CCDs to do an experiment to look for dark matter uh, electron scattering okay. that's going to happen over the next year or two <coughs> so that's a pretty recent development question? oh, no yeah so these are pretty small detectors. Yeah, so they're very small, right? So these are not the ton scale things, but you don't need them to make progress because no one has been able to be sensitive to you know, this, this mass range of dark matter below the GB scale much. Um, so you can do a lot of stuff with, with small detectors. So another recent breakthrough came from the Super CDMS collaboration where they also use silicon, but the readout is very different. So what Super CMS does They've got a silicon puck. So there's some silicon material here. Um, they apply a voltage across electric field across the silicon slab. Um, let's say dark matter comes in and creates an electron and a whole pair or creates a few electron all pairs. What they do is they then have this electric field which accelerates the electrons and holes. Those electrons and holes will barrel through the crystal. They're going to create phonons, which is basically heat, but they're going to create some phonons. They're going to shake, uh, they're going to create vibrational modes. They're going to shake the crystal, it's gonna, and they're going to measure that. And they've got sens sensors, you know, on, there's a super schematic, okay. Anyway, they've got sensors, on the CCD which are called transition edge sensors so transition edge sensors are sensors are, are basically they're, they're some superconducting material the, they're placed right at the phase transition from being superconducting to going non-superconducting and you measure the change um, when a little bit of heat is transferred so the right of the phase transition, there's a little bit of heat that gets generated. So there's phonons that gets generated as these electrons move through. They measure these phonons, um, they will then you know, induce this transition in the, in the superconducting, uh, the, the, they induce the superconducting phase transition, um, and they're going to measure that. And what they've also been able to do, they've demonstrated sensitivity to measuring single electron all pairs as well. What I'm trying to say, demonstrate single electron all pair I don't know, sensitivity. Okay. So those, I think, are two efforts. Uh, and now, so now the question is, of course, you know, can you scale this up? And there's efforts trying to do, to do that. There's lots of R&D going on to try and make these bigger. So what they've done so far, I should say, what's been demonstrated so far is <coughs> one gram detector of this. And right now, Sensei, there's a 0.1 gram CCD operating right now, but there's more better ones on the way. Um, And then just to give you some references for this, where are my references? Mm. Oh, here we go. <coughs> so this is was demonstrated in a paper 2017, and then the first dark matter results using like this tiny single CCD which doesn't have much mass we're in 1804 point 
0.00088. And for super city mass, it was demonstrated in a paper at the end of 2017. And that's some documented results. in a paper in April this year. Um, and these, basically, these results papers that I mentioned, those are the first dark matter direct detection results down to, cro down to masses of um, order 500 keV or so. Okay. So those go down to 500 keV. So orders of magnitude lower than, than previous bounds for, from like the, the WIMP searches. Okay, so there's lots of activity. The goal now is to build this up. There's lots of other ideas out there that people are trying to put together. Um, and make realize, um, and we'll see. You know, the next five to ten years, there's R and D needed to try and build up some of these ideas to go to even lower masses, to scale these existing things that sort of work, uh, scale them up to higher masses, to probe lower cross sections. But in principle, you can do a lot. Okay, so there's lots of new dark matter parameter space going to be covered over the next few years. Okay, so that's a very good question. I didn't talk about backgrounds. And if any of these experiments ever announces the results, that's what your question should be. Like, what about the backgrounds? Okay, so that's a very good question. Um, so it turns out that we don't expect backgrounds really from... So there's shielding that you do. You put them underground. But for a search that's of order 100 gram years of exposure, so if you take the 100 gram CCDs and you expose them for a year, we don't expect any backgrounds from Comptons or radioactivity. Uh, the reason is that usually the backgrounds from radioactivity, they'll have, like Compton gamma rays, they'll be 100 keV or tens of keV. And yes, there's a tail that goes all the way down to a few EV, but the tail is very small. So people can shield, and that's demonstrated that you can basically shield enough that that background should be low enough, down to the energy range you care about. Because 100 keV, your photon is going to give a signal that's way on this plot here. It's going to be way, way above there. So you don't care about that at those events. You want to look for just in a few bins. Okay. Um, there are things you have to worry about, like dark counts. So super CD mass, they apply an electric field, and when you apply electric field, sometimes the thing will just spit out electrons for fun. So you create something with an electri electric field, and you've got some cathode, and it just spits out, you know, electrons. Uh, Unfortunately, so there's some dark count which is exists. Okay, for CCDs, the thing you have to worry about is that you have um, the CCDs sit in a temperature of about 100 Kelvin. So that's a pretty low temperature, but it's not that low. And what you can actually get, you get thermal fluctuations from the valence band to the conduction band, where occasionally you'll just get thermal fluctuations of an electron that just pops out. Okay, so it actually, so for Sensei, probably one can't use the, the, there'll be so many single electron events from thermal fluctuations that that's not the bin that you want to look at. So probably your threshold won't be one electron, but it's going to be two electrons and above. Because the chance of getting two thermal fluctuations, the same pixel, you know, in some exposure is very low. Okay, so there's things you have to worry about. And that's the question you should ask if anyone puts out a result and claims dark matter. But there's actually a lot of optimism that you can do this background, uh, ba basically background free search. <coughs> okay, so in the last 20 minutes, I want to talk very briefly about models and show you some plots. So let's look at um, C, and I just want to give you an example. And there's there's more than just you know the, these examples that I'll mention. Um, so let's go back to our simplest thing of having a dark matter coupled to a dark photon. Okay, um, we can get we can have the following process. So we're going to consider a particular parameter range, which we've been doing so far already. 
right, we're going to take the dark photon mass to be bigger than twice the dark matter mass. Right, so the, if you produce a dark photon in your accelerator, it's going to decay to dark matter. Okay. So for this example, or in this case, what you can get is uh, a diagram like this. Where the dark matter particles can annihilate in the early universe to standard model particles. And you can get freeze out from this, thermal freeze out. All right? So the annihilation cross section here is going to be approximately, so uh, there's some standard model fermion here. Let's just consider electrons to be precise, but of course you have to include all of them, all the fermions, but let's just do, do that. Uh, so there's going to be a coupling of A prime to the electrons here, so, and that gets squared, so there's going to be some alpha epsilon squared. On this side, there's some G dark coupling, so that's going to be some alpha dark, okay, G dark squared over 4 pi. Uh, there's a propagator here from the dark photon, so there's going to be some Ma prime to the fourth, and then there's a turns out a mass. <coughs> well, and that this depends on the dark matter mass, m chi squared in the numerator. So that has the right units, um, and this gets multiplied by either one or v squared, depending on whether the chi that I'm considering is a fermion or a scalar. Okay, so I'm going a little bit more into detail now of, uh, of how this annihilation works. And I want to mention one thing you have to worry about when you do model building for light dark matter. There's one important constraint that you have to worry about. So here's what the dependence is. And this you can calculate. So this is a complex scalar. You actually get a V squared here. If it's a fermion, you just don't get a V squared. And the V squared means it's P wave, okay? That's what uh, Tao, I think, was telling you in terms of, you went through that yesterday. And if it's, uh, if it's one here, it's S wave. Okay. So, <coughs> there's one important constraint. Which comes actually from the CMB. There's one important constraint in light dark matter which comes from the cosmic microwave background. If you've got dark matter particles annihilating during the time of cosmic microwave background, during the time that the cosmic microwave background is being formed, about an electron volt, right? A, a temperature of about an electron volt, a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Then you potentially have a problem, because if the dark matter particles annihilate and dump charged particles into the you know, universe, it'll affect the power spectrum of the CMB, it'll affect your CMB. The CMB starts forming when the electrons and protons combine to hydrogen and the universe becomes neutral. But if you're dumping in charged particles from dark matter annihilation, for example, you have a problem. Okay? And it turns out that the constraints are very strong that um, you basically, for S-wave annihilation, you exclude the WIMP parameter <coughs> space. You exclude the cross-section that you need to get the right relic abundance. Okay? Uh, just because it's, it's such a strong constraint. So below 10 GV, you basically can't have S-wave dark matter annihilation. Now, why does P-wave work? The reason P wave is okay is because the dark matter velocity at the time of the CMB formation is very low. The universe is very cold. So the, the dark matter forms during freeze out. It freezes out non relativistically, but like we said yesterday, when I say non relativistic, it's not very non relativistic. Okay, it's 0.3 C. So it's non relativistic, but it's still moving at a very high velocity. So in that case, both these cross-sections are roughly very, are very similar. Okay. But then the universe expands, the universe cools, the dark matter cools, the velocity slows down. And there's still, even though this <coughs> process is frozen out, occasionally you will still find a few dark matter particles that annihilate and will dump and will annihilate standard model particles. That will still happen, just at a much reduced rate that doesn't change the abundance of the dark matter much. But nevertheless, that annihilation is still going on at a reduced rate. But if you've got P wave suppression, this P wave annihilation, it's multiplied by V squared annihilation rate. And in that case, the velocity being so small, like 10 to the minus 6 C or so, there's a huge suppression in the annihilation rate. And in that case, there is no bound from the CMB. But if you've got S wave annihilation, there is no velocity dependence in the annihilation cross section, annihilation rate. 
nonation is too high and you're going to mess up the CMB. So the CMB excludes dark matter annihilation that is S wave for dark matter masses about 10 GeV. So if you're interested in sub-GeV dark matter, this is an important constraint. You can't just have anything you want. Okay, you have to worry about this bound, and you have to avoid S-wave annihilation. <coughs> so what we see here is that, so let me just write here, this is a complex scalar, not a real scalar. Okay, so we see the complex scalar is safe, so that's a good candidate, but the fermion is excluded. <coughs> and just to be clear, it's excluded to receive or to obtain its relic abundance from thermal freeze out. But for the complex scalar, you're fine, and you can just calculate what the parameters are that you need in order to get the right annihilation rate. You know what the cross-section has to be. It has to be a water pico bond, okay, to get the right relic abundance. Um, and then the complex scalar is fine, safe, okay. <coughs> yeah. So in this case, um, no, it doesn't, because what's <laughs> fixed, what, but basically what you what you suppress it, what, what you're concerning is sigma v. So yes, it depends on the bound of the mediator, but if you change the mediator mass to get the right relic abundance, to get the right cross section, you have to change these other parameters as well. Okay. So it's a bound on the annihilation cross section. And um, the bound from the CMB, so if you look at sigma v times m chi, what you want to get the right relic abundance is you know, uh, the picobahn times the velocity. So it's, it's here. But the bound goes, does something like this. Everything above it is excluded. And this is sitting at 10 GV. Okay, that's, so, so you want this cross section to get the right relic abundance. This is the bound, what the bound does. And the reason, again, it gets stronger at low mass is because for lower masses, you've got more dark matter, right? Because the density is fixed, but not the number abundance. So if you decrease the mass, you have more of them to make up the same density. Okay. Just like for the dark matter, th that's why the limits also weaken for higher masses. Okay. <coughs> okay. So nevertheless, what you can do is you can still make the fermion work, you just can't have, as a viable candidate, you just can't have it, its abundance set by thermal freeze-out. And instead, what you can do is you can get its abundance from some other way, like asymmetric dark matter. So asymmetric dark matter is also an interesting idea. So, you know, baryons, the reason we've got a relic abundance of baryons rather than antibaryons is because of some initial asymmetry, the baryon-antibaryon asymmetry, the matter-antimatter matter asymmetry. So there's some initial asymmetry that is exists in the universe, we don't know how it exists, how it came to be, uh, which created, which left over more you know, protons and antiprotons. Um, and we can imagine that the same thing happens for the dark matter, that there's more dark matter particles and not as many anti-dark matter particles. So in that case, you just have a lot more, um, you have some final radic abundance. In which case, you don't actually get the bound, uh, in which case this bound doesn't exactly apply. Okay, so you, you can get the relic abundance from that. Okay. So, let me see. Okay, I don't have too much more time. So I'm not going to explain in more detail how this might work, but at least we've got one example of the complex scalar being safe. And as I said, you can make this work as well. You just have to make sure it gets an asymmetric abundance. Okay. <coughs> so then, uh, this is sort of a nice model because it's very predictive. You've got these parameters that are now fixed. And now what you can do is you can make predictions 
for direct detection experiments or for beam dump experiments. Why? Let's focus on just the direct detection experiments. The direct detection experiments, the low mass ones, they look for dark matter scattering of electrons. How is that done? Well, it's mediated by this particular process. How is that process scale? So this direct detection cross-section, so the cross-section scatter of an electron, is given by the same diagram, just rotated. So it's the same parameters. And the basic parameters that you get here are just alpha, alpha dark. Let me not care about pi's, <coughs> etc. So I'm just going to make a proportionality sign. It's the same parameters. The reduced mass is a little bit different. But otherwise, you know, the combination alpha dark epsilon squared over ma prime to the fourth is exactly the same. So this is equal to some particular number. So this combination of parameters is equal to the number. And it's the same combination of parameters on this side. This factor is different. But for a given dark matter mass, I've got a precise relationship. So if I get the right relic abundance, I know what direct detection cross-section to aim for. Same thing with beam dump experiments. They basically have a very similar combination of parameters. Okay. <coughs> so same combination of parameters as cross-section that as for cross-section that sets relic abundance. So that's a nice benchmark model, and you can invent others. And let me just show you that benchmark model. Now I'm going to make a show you professional versions of the plot rather than my hand drawings. So let me move the board so I can actually have access to the Okay, does that work? Okay, so here is this target for the complex scalar in the sigma E versus m chi plane. So I had to fix some combination of parameters for the dark photo mass to the dark matter mass. So I just made the dark photo mass three times the dark matter mass. Okay, that satisfies this basic assumption that it's above two times the, that the dark photon is two times the dark matter mass. And then I can be very predictive, and that's the cross section to scatter of electrons that you need for the complex scalar. For the asymmetric Fermi, I said you can make it work as well. I didn't explain exactly how, but it turns out that it works as long as you're above this thin line here. So everything above here, the asymmetric fermion works. On this line, the complex scalar works. And then you can put on the bounds that exist from all the things we've heard about, from the beam dump experiments, from, from mini boon. So the green thing is the bound from mini boon. E137, LSD, beam dump experiments. Babad did a search for E plus E minus going to gamma plus nothing. All those bounds you can put on the plot. And is there a way to lower the lights? I don't know. The bottom one? Thank you. So, can everyone see? You see? No? Oh. Okay, sorry. Good? Okay, everyone can see? Okay, good. So, uh, much better. Okay, so you see all these bounds that we talked about, the different things. Uh, I mentioned that there's a bound from Xenon 10 data. That's this bound there. Uh, Xenon 100 turns out also has a bound that's over there. But here's the search by Mini Boon in 2017. Babad did, did a search, etc. Um, and for very heavy dark matter masses, so this is a GV, this is an MEV, but for very heavy dark matter masses, the dark matter can scatter also of nuclei, and then the, then the usual experiments are sensitive, like the nuclear recall searches are sensitive to, to those searches. So at that point, they come in and set strong constraints. But you can see that this simple benchmark model, which is one of several, is still unconstrained over a big part of the parameter space. And this other one is also unconstrained. Okay. And then in terms of projections, what people have proposed, here are some examples. So I've changed the colors a little bit in the background. But here's this 
complex scalar line. Here's this asymmetric fermion. I put out some other dark matter models in orange here, which we don't have to worry about now. Um, but here's the sensor protection for a one gram experiment. Here's a 100 gram experiment running for a year. Okay, so you can see you can cover lots of new parameter space where these models live. And there's lots of other ideas, scintillators, uh, Damagon Ks, like Sensei, just, just a future version of it with more mass, super CDMS potentially, what they can do, superconductors, etc. Okay, so we're probing sort of useful parameter space over the next you know, five to ten years. Current nuclear recoil, nuclear recoil searches. The, so for heavy mass, you know, the dark photon will also mediate interaction with nuclei, and then like the lux and the other constraints that look for nuclear recoils are relevant. And they've got very heavy masses; they lot have a lot of exposures, uh, so they they go they very set very strong constraints. But they can't probe lower right now. Could you give us a reference for this? <coughs> This plot you can get in the um, causing visions thing. So I'll write down the reference again. So this is really the collection of many people's work over many papers. Uh, and there was an attempt to summarize by the community in this paper. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so, good. So then, ah, I still have three minutes. Good. Okay. Um, there's other models which you can probe. Okay, anyway, so let me not talk about this. Here's some accelerator based projections uh, where the, this, so, uh, if you work, if you're a direct detection person, you plot things differently than an accelerator person for some reason. Uh, well, there's fine reasons, but basically th this is now a different parameter that's usually called Y, which is just sigma E, but scaled by some mass ratios, okay? But it basically is the same, same thing, just projected differently as what you saw before. Um, and here's all the current constraints in gray, and then the future projections. So here, for example, and there's also the targets. So there's the asymmetric fermion that I mentioned, Here's the scalar that I actually explained in some detail, and then some other possible targets from other dark matter models. And here's this LDMX projection. Um, there is BDX in this blue one. Uh, BAL2, looking for gamma plus invisible. That's roughly the projection. We'll see how they can do. So you see over the next few years, we can sort of probe simple models of dark matter that um, live below the GV scale. Here? Uh, no, in the oh, here? Models, yes. So uh, the reason is because if you look at this diagram there, when the dark photon mass is close to the rho resonance, it's the k-width changes. Okay, and in particular, it gets larger. So in that case, you know, if the width gets larger, you want the couplings to be a little bit smaller in order to compensate to get the same cross-section, which is why it dips down or where these dip down, okay? Um, actually, not this, sorry. Yeah, I mean this one, this one. This dips down. And this, um, yeah, okay. So there's various resonances basically in the R <laughs> parameter, which uh, that's where the dip comes from. Okay. Um, so that's almost all. I want to just go back to show you a professional version of this dark photon parameter space that I drew by hand yesterday, um, which is really very good, but here's the actual plot. Um, so here's epsilon as a function of the dark photon mass, where the dark photon indicates the standard model particles directly, okay? So here are the beam dump constraints, uh, and then top there's the searches, Chloe and uh, Baba searches, Apex, Mainz, that's, that's A1 here. Um, and what you see is that the G minus two region, that's the favorite in green, the G minus two region, and you see it's ruled out for this particular decay channel. Okay. And then you see the future projections. So this says pre-2021. So by 2021, this is a, I think actually not a totally unreasonable projection of what we might have. I'm sure it's gonna be less than this parameter space that's gonna be covered by 2021. So it's not gonna be all these, project these all projections. I think we'll cover less at the end of the day, but maybe some good fraction of what's actually being projected today. Okay. And then the, finally, the same channel 
but decaying invisibly. So now that's the dark photon decaying to light dark matter. Here are the constraints in gray. So I mentioned to you this NA64 search very recently. There's a Baba search looking for gamma plus nothing. And here's the G minus two favored band. And again, you see it's excluded, unfortunately. Okay. The G minus two might still work for other decay channels, right? So if you've got some complicated decay that no experimentalist has looked for, then uh, it might still be that the dark photon has some complicated decay, but also explains the G minus two of the muon. But at least for invisible decays and for standard model decays, it's ruled out. And then again, you see future projections, what experiments can do. OK, that I think is all. So I think what I hope to convey is that dark sectors, there's many motivations you know, to look for them. There's many ways we in principle can look for new physics, but dark, sector physic dark sectors are one example of it, which I think is, uh, has a lot of activity going on right now. And uh, I hope I convinced you at least of that. Gave you some references. And um, yeah, hope to just give you flavor. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Did you see it's already a little bit out of date the cosmic vision paper? A little bit, yeah. So, you know, there's been actual progress from Super CDMS and Sensei in terms of uh, making an actual constraint. Uh, there's been another search, I think, by NA64 for visible dark matter. So this plot that I showed here is slightly. There's another NA64 line that should go on this. Okay. You know, there's things like that. And there's also some new theory ideas for new experiments. So it's, not, it's, it's a good reference. Okay. But I'm just saying the field is moving quickly that it's technically so already doesn't cover everything. And next year, will they do another cosmic vision? Like the question was, next year, are they going to do another cosmic vision? So in the... In the DOE, there's an effort to try and uh, come up with, in the Department of Energy in the US, there's an effort to try and figure out what, what's good science to fund. Mm -hmm. So there'll be some more um, uh, effort to try and narrow that down. Uh, I don't know if there'll be another review, re review paper. Um, I've written four of these review papers over the last six, seven years, and I'm tired. I just want to get money to do an experiment. But yeah. yeah. sensitivity of some of the experiments uh, for the cross-section with electron was around 10 to the negative 14 centimeters square. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this one maybe. So I think in one of the uh, observations that came out in March uh, of the 21 centimeter line, they were claiming that uh, to have sufficient heating of variables from dark matter, the cross-section should be about 10 to the negative 20 centimeters square around the GDB scale. So yeah. I think these experiments should be pretty straightforward, right? They're so much more sensitive. So good, very good question. So actually, the edges stuff, uh, so edges is a 21 centimeter experiment that saw a signal that's much larger than what they expected to see. And the suggestion is that maybe dark matter can help cool the baryons in the very early universe to create the signal. This is a very high redshift, that redshift of 17 or so. And so if dark matter interacts with baryons, then it could potentially explain this 21 centimeter anomaly. Um, and one way to do that is through milli-charged particles. So dark matter scattering of uh, electrons or ordinary matter through a photon. Um, and in that case, the scattering is, is actually one of a Q to the fourth. So it's the scattering scales is one of a Q to the fourth. So the plot that I showed you here is not applicable because that assumes actually that the mediator is heavy and there's no momentum dependence in the interaction. But here, there is this form factor. This is, this is for a different form factor, and this is actually a more relevant plot. So I don't have the best plot to show this, but you're right. that the, So for this particular interaction, the cross-section that you need is sitting pretty high and is sitting above these things. Okay. Uh, I didn't show you the parameter space at high cross-sections. I can show you offline. I've got plots like that. But it... Um, and then, so the, the thing to note is that all these experiments, these are direct detection experiments. And you see that these are the only things in this region. There's no other searches actually in this region. Uh, the reason is that the, this is for very low momentum transfer. So experiments with low, very low momentum transfer can have very large cross sections. Um, and beam dump experiments or collider experiments have typically very large momentum transfers. So the cross section will be small. So they can't probe to very low cross sections in this parameter space. But 
Um, all these direct detection experiments, they assume that the dark matter can make it to the detector. If the dark matter is very strong interacting, it might get stuck in the atmosphere, or it might get stuck on the Earth as it tries to make it to the underground detector. So these experiments that I've shown here, they actually cut off at some very large cross-section. And in principle, it's possible that there's an open gap where you could explain the edges signal and there's no constraints. Okay? Uh, so that's very interesting. And they, there's you know, potential constraints from, um, from the CMB and from BBN, et cetera, that you have to worry about. But there's also some ideas of trying to put a sensei-like detector on a satellite where you, don't have to sh where you not, don't have to worry about the Earth effects or atmospheric effects of the dark matter stopping it. You just put in a satellite, you have no, uh, you have no stopping from the dark matter, and then looking for that kind of dark matter on a satellite with like a, with like a, you know, a CCD or so. So that's actually a very interesting topic where you might still be able to explain the signal because uh, the constraints will disappear at very high cross-section. But that's actually work in progress. That's active research. Does that answer your question? I hope. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was a long answer. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thanks very much.